So hi guys, my name is Bansi Anand and I welcome you to this series called RBI 24-7. So guys, I am a JRF holder in management and commerce and I've done my post-graduation from Delhi School of Economics. So this was a brief introduction about your mentor for this series and as you all must be knowing that we conduct a five question series and before we move to question number one, I would like to ask you guys to subscribe to our channel. So if you are a new entrant here and watching our video for the very first time, don't forget to hit this button. It can help you to stay in touch with us and don't forget to press this bell icon as it will help you to get notifications whenever any new update comes up, right? And you can also join our telegram group on this group. You can post all your doubts and queries and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible for resolving all your doubts. Apart from that, if you ever have any doubt, you can always, uh, always comment on the videos and try placing them on a latest video. It is easier to track and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. So guys, here is your first question for today. I hope the screen is perfectly visible and let me read it out. This question says dash a term coined by John Keynes refer to the ways that human emotion can drive financial decision making in uncertain environments and volatile times. Okay, seems like a simple question. Just a statement. You have to tell the correct answer. Moving ahead to correct option for this question and the correct option is option E. Option E means animal spirits. So, John Keynes, I think this is the most famous name in economics. John Keynes, he came up with this term called animal spirits. So, guys, in very simple terms, whenever we talk about the difference between animals and humans, we talk about in terms that how humans are able to... Uh, Humans are capable of controlling their emotions and they have a control over what they are thinking, over their actions, what they are doing. But animals, they are they do not have such sort of control over what, over their emotions or or over their natural uh, natural tendencies. But but humans do. But whenever humans leaving their rational behavior aside they tend to focus on their emotions and let their emotions let their feelings drive their financial decisions then we call it following the animal spirits so animal spirits they can go working in both ways uh, it can be a positive way driving the markets up and it can be in a negative way driving the markets down so let us try to understand a little bit a little bit more about animal spirits so animal spirits describe psychological and emotional factors that drive investors to take emotion take action when faced with high levels of volatile uh, volatility in capital markets so guys see this animal spirits it connects finance with psychology right and it gets its terms from behavioral investing or you can say behavioral sciences right so basically in simple terms whenever someone without behaving rationally see whenever we talk about any model or any economic theory we assume that the consumer uh, in whose respect we are talking about is a rational consumer but here we are saying that no uh, the investor which we are talking about, the person who is taking the action, the doer, the doer is not rational but being driven by the feelings or emotions, right? So, a very simple concept. Animal spirits represent the emotions of confidence, hope and fear, pessimism. So, as I just told you, it can be optimist and it can be pessimist. So, it can go both ways so see if we talk about current times when we are going through a pandemic and our economies are totally devastated we need to drive these animal spirits but what happens is whenever times are highly volatile or whenever uh, there is a crisis going on like this like the current situation these animal spirits they work in a pessimistic way 
and that is why people are scared of investing they don't uh, they don't want to put their money into some uh, uh, into some risky investment avenues but undoubtedly that is a driver for growth so uh, we need to push the animal spirits in current times so that we can drive growth right but if we talk about conditions such as if you remember 2008 global financial crisis so the root cause behind this crisis was the irrational behavior of many uh, many giant players in the financial markets right when they do not think rationally but they go on with their with their emotions and guys i think i have told you uh, this about this movie many times enron the smartest guys in the room so this movie very beautifully shows you that how uh, companies they used to drive their uh drive their employees or drive the uh, or push the adrenalish adrenaline rush in them so that they can put their uh, put their adventure adventure spirit to investing or they can make them they can increase their risk appetite right so if these spirits are low confidence levels will be low which will drive down a promising market even if the market or economy fundamentals are good so basically here the economy is working on expectations not on fundamentals and uh, in contrast when the spirits are high confidence is high and people are going to be investing without thinking too much right so this is what happens this is usually uh, these any this these animal spirits these are behind growth but if they are not tamed properly then they are going to lead to a crisis like global financial crisis so see here obviously we need to drive these animal spirits but the government they need to tame these animal spirits so that they do not lead to a crisis right so it is very important to maintain balance between them so although this term was coined by keynes but um, but after global financial crisis it became popular when two famous economists they again came up with it and they uh, included the role of government as i just told you to tame these spirits so guys here is a question for you you have to mention in comments that who are these two economists who brought back the usage of this term animal spirits in their book right so i'll wait for your comments and let's see who gets the correct names okay here is your second question for today this question says which of the following is an idea which makes it difficult to carry out a transition from an inefficient system to an efficient one right so moving ahead to the solution for this question and the solution is option b option b means transitional gains trap so guys see this seems like a very tricky or complex term but try breaking it down so it breaks down into three terms first is transitional after that gains after that trap see transition means a journey or a change or switching from one system to another system is known as transition right but this phenomena called transitional gains trap it it makes it difficult to chuck an inefficient system and uh, and get along with an efficient one right now let's understand about this transitional gains trap but uh, let's try to understand this with the help of an example let's say government comes up with a subsidy scheme right so uh, they are thinking of providing subsidies now uh, due to if we are talking about a country like india emerging economies who have problems of chronism and corruption i hope we all are meaning uh, we all are clear with the uh, meaning of the word chronism so in simple terms chronism means uh, uh, chronism means providing benefit to your knowns rather than someone who deserves the benefit right so in emerging economies this, these are some major problems so if we talk about a country like india where government has come up with a subsidy scheme due to these problems we all know what is going to happen the benefit is going to be taken by the creamy layer and the section for which the benefit was intended is not going to be provided to them right so now what happens is okay government knows government realizes this fact after some years that okay this benefit that we have been providing is not leading to any gains to the 
under privileged section but it is being taken off by some other section of society that does not need it or that does not deserve to use it or avail it right but because just uh, just because that section has resources to avail it they are having that benefit now government thinks of uh, getting rid of this scheme because obviously they are investing so much money into it and they say let's chuck the system out and put our money to some better usage but now it is going to be very difficult for them to uh, get rid of this scheme and move to a new system or move to an efficient system just because that section that that section that uh, avail the benefit of these two problems the privileged section who was using the benefit provided by government they are going to protest obviously since they are now used to getting those benefits they are not letting it go so easily right so that is a transitional gain trap now government is in a trap because if they want to uh, if they want to get rid of this inefficient system they will have to face protest of this section which is considerably resourceful uh, this is uh, it is not the case that they are under privilege or they are not having resources since they are resourceful they were uh, they were earlier also they were using their resources to avail the benefits so that is why they are going to create problems for government and if they continue the scheme they know that they are spending money on a section that does not need that benefit and this money could have been put to a better use right so this is known as a transitional gain trap so guys if you remember in one of our previous session we discussed about a topic called rent seeking behavior so this trap it has its roots in this rent seeking behavior problem so i hope we all are clear with this and if not you can ask for its link in the comments right moving ahead i think we have discussed all of the points here so yeah gordon telak he came up with this concept and he uh, considered this a tragedy because it puts government in a very job it it jeopardizes the positions of governments right so uh, if uh, i am just uh, remembering this that if you remember when we discussed eurozone crisis then also we discussed that how in greece this was a major problem that government had spent so much money on public and they got used to so many benefits and now it was very difficult to roll them back right so it, it is very difficult but okay so gordon's recommendation is that government should not get into these traps because it is very difficult and hard to get out of and this idea helps us to under, understand that why government privileges have durability long after so government con schemes that are not of any use that are not providing benefits to the intended section that are also continued just because governments are scared of protest of that section availing the benefits right okay moving ahead to the next question here is your third question for today i hope the screen is visible okay this question says in relation to the current norms for minimum public shareholding that companies have to maintain post bankruptcy select the correct statement or statements so few statements given to you so guys this is a time where you have to pause the video and go through these four statements and select the correct statements about this particular topic of uh, minimum public share holdings right so moving ahead to the correct option for this question and the correct option is option b option b means just a second okay sorry the correct option is option a option a means only one is the correct statement rest three statements they are not right the correct statement is if due to infusion of fresh funds okay first let us move to the solution and then we'll discuss the statements okay here you can see right typically companies emerging out of ibc see their public share holdings fall below 25% mark because of fresh fund infusion so what happens is whenever there is a company which has gone through some sort of 
insolvency and bankruptcy proceedings or that company has faced a default that has gone through the uh, bankruptcy resolution process then it's um, it's shareholding which is it's shareholding which is held by public or the retail investors or the small investors it goes down to 25% goes down below 25% so it is not necessary it is just a general observation so why is it so because see if any company is coming for their rescue is if uh, for of a firm which has been suffering through some financial difficulties or which have been bankrupt obviously they are going to buy a big stake in that bankrupt firm to save it right when they buy a big stake uh, the proportion which is held by public uh, goes goes to that particular uh, buyer of that uh, significant stake right so that is why fresh funds are infused um, uh, public shareholdings goes below 25% now what is going to happen now what happens is when these companies they have to be listed they at least have to maintain 25% of min public shareholding right and if they don't have it then it becomes a problem for them so to ease this problem sebi is coming up with some new rules they are thinking to bring this down this percentage down to 5% so that companies can gradually increase it not at once but gradually so to ease the process market regulator sebi had allowed companies to maintain a lower public float and bring it up to the required threshold so according to the current rules if the minimum public shareholding is below 10% companies can bring it up to 10% within 18 months so let's say there is a company which has gone through resolution it was a bankrupt company and its public shareholding has come down to 8% now sebi is giving them 18 months to make this 8% into 10% within these 18 months and after that take it to 25% in 3 years right so Fifth, uh, so uh, a, right, eighteen months for ten percent and three years for twenty five percent. So this was a case when the minimum public shareholding it falls to below ten percent. And if the shareholding falls below twenty five percent, but it is still above ten percent, then companies needed to need to bring it up to twenty five percent in three years from the date of fall. So if the shareholding is fifteen percent. then this is going to be applicable they have to bring it to 25 within 3 years right so these are the current norms now sebi is thinking to tweak it to at least 5% share holdings at the time of relisting when after resolution uh, after having the bankruptcy processes company is coming back to be listed they are saying that okay at the time of listing you should have 5% public share holdings and after that in the next 12 months that is one year companies would increase it to 10% and the remaining 10% can be in one other year right so making a total of 25 since 5% was already there in a uh, one year making it 10 and in the next other year making it 10 extra taking the total to 25 right see so you can see here 5 10 and 10 makes a total of 25 right so guys why do you think for publicly listed company for uh, listed companies it is it is important to have public shareholdings see where in a company where the ownership is concentrated or the majority stake is within is divided amongst a, lit, a, a few shareholders then that company is bound then that company has more chances to indulge in some wrong doings because see there are not many stakeholders there are not many shareholders to take decision the decision making power is divided amongst few shareholders right that is why they are saying if you want to be listed if you want to come back oh you have to maintain a minimum public shareholding because the companies where public shareholding is high their public is the owner rather than the management right that is why that company has lesser chances of indulging into some wrong activities right so moving ahead here is our fourth question for today which says as per the gst act the amount collected from the levy of cess 
during the entire year is credit to a non lapsable fund called gst compensation says fund Okay, a simple question. It is part of the dash and is used to provide compensation to states in the event of loss of revenue. Very simple question. They are saying that the money that governments get from the levy of this cess, it is put into GST compensation cess fund. Right. So this is the fund they are getting money into this fund. This fund is part of which account? You have to tell. Out of these five, where does compensation cess fund come? Right. Moving ahead to the solution, and the correct option for this question is option B. That is public accounts of India. So it comes under public accounts of India. So the, recently there was a tussle. Let's try to understand it. Here you can see. The CAG, that is Comptroller and Auditor General, recently raised the issue, raised objections to the center transferring money from compensation cess fund to the consolidated fund of India, terming the transfer illegal. See, guys, whatever money government collects, so here, so here is the money they collect from the cess. Says is nothing but a charge, a sort of tax that they make applicable. Right, money they collect from this says it goes into a particular fund which is known as GST compensation fund because it is used to provide compensation to states if their GST short fall. Right, so it is put into this fund and this fund is part of public accounts of India. So guys, if you remember in one of our previous sessions, we have discussed about different accounts uh, which are maintained, contingency fund of India, public accounts and consolidated funds. So to give you a brief, brief public, uh, consolidated funds of India is a basic revenue and expenditure nature account where all the revenue and expenditure goes. Public accounts of India, it holds money for some specific purposes. The money which we know, where does it have to go, right? The specific purpose and contingency fund as the name tells you for some unforeseen circumstances. So if you want to learn about them in detail, you can ask for that video's link. So now they are saying this GST compensation fund in which CES is put it comes under public accounts of India. But what did government do? They took money from this fund and put it into consolidated fund of India that is under revenue and expenditure fund of India. Right. So CAG, they told them that this is illegal. You cannot do it. It violates the law. That is why now they have put the money back into the compensation fund. I hope the story is clear to you. Okay. Now, why do you think government did that? What is the benefit out of it? So, putting money into... Just a second. Okay. Putting money into consolidated funds of India rather than public accounts of India helps government to reduce their deficit because this account as I just told you it holds the revenue and expenditure so if they are putting the income from that says into revenue it is boosting their revenue and reducing the deficit or reducing the shortfall so it pre presents a better image of government whereas it should have gone under public accounts because it has a specific purpose right it is not available to government for any other purposes. So that is why they said, CAG said that this transfer is illegal. It violated the law. Uh, I just told you about this consolidated fund. So following CAG findings, CAG clarified that it has transferred the funds back to compensation fund as I just told you. So the present legal structure requires any surplus and compensation funds funds to be kept in the fund for future shortfalls. So 
or if there is an excess of funds in public accounts of india under gst compensation says fund that cannot be transferred to government's revenue that has to be kept in that fund only for any future uses or to compensate states in the future right moving ahead to the last question here is your last question for today and this question says in the rbi uh, rbi and market standoff the loser has been the corporate borrower so a statement given to you which talks about some sort of conflict some sort of standoff so you have to tell which of the following statements five statements given to you which of these statements are true about this standoff which is being talked about in, in this statement moving ahead to the solution and the solution says that the correct option is c c means statement number 1 and 2 they are correct that means rbi wants the yield to be lower for bond sale auction but the bond traders they are demanding higher yields and these three statements they are not right so guys if you remember in one of our previous sessions we discussed that how rbi is trying to keep the yields low why are they trying to keep the yields low so that the cost of borrowing in the economy stays low if the cost of borrowing is low many people can borrow it incentivizes people and corporates to borrow stimulating demand in the economy and in return growth right so that is why rbi has been trying to reduce the interest rates from past one and a half year since uh, the beginning of 2019 they have been trying to do it but they were able to do it in this corona virus period right but see bond traders they are asking for high yields because there are expectations of high inflation in there are, there are many uh, there are many discussions and debates going about how inflation is high cpi for august has been 6.69% which is above the target of government government has a target of 2 to 6% but it was recorded at 6.9% which is above the target right so whenever there is inflation the lenders they charge more rate of interest to compensate themselves for the inflation for the rising inflation so this is leading to these bond traders bond traders are no one but buyers of bond whoever are going to buy so they are not willing to buy bonds at lower yields at rbi as rbi wants them to so this is the conflict that is why whatever uh, bonds are being sold by rbi they are being bought by the underwriters because of this problem because of bond traders bidding at high yields right so rbi wants yield curve to be flatter not upward sloping here it was mentioned it wants upward sloping that is why it was wrong so they want that the difference between the short term curve and the long see guys here i would just draw a diagram here is a graph in this graph this is the yield curve so a point here which i am marking with green on x axis so on x axis is the term of investment or duration or you can see say the uh, duration of the bond on y axis there is the yield see for short term bond if the graph if the shape of the graph is like this upward sloping dekho yahan pe niche hai yahan pe upar aa raha hai matlab upar ki taraf ja raha hai from left to right right so that means it's an upward sloping graph aur yahan pe jahan par short term bonds ki baat ho rahi hai let's say one year bonds ki baat ho rahi hai to yahan pe yield kam hai but agar hum baat karte hain यहां पे जाके जहां पे लेट्स से 15 ईयर बॉन्ड की बात हो रही है एक ऐसा बॉन्ड जो इफ वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट अ बॉन्ड व्हिच इज बीइंग इशूड फॉर 15 इयर्स दैट मींस अ लॉन्ग टर्म बॉन्ड द यील्ड्स आर हाई सो आरबीआई डज नॉट वांट दिस आरबीआई वांट्स अ फ्लैटर ग्राफ 
something like this. So that there is no different, there is uh, there is very less difference between the yields at short term and the long term. So since we are talking about the graph, usually when we talk about graph, the short term securities they are referred to as the front end. And the long term securities, they are referred to as the long end securities, right? And the, the ones which lie in the middle, like you can say 8 to 10 years, they are known as belly of the curve, belly of curve, right? So I hope this is clear to you. This belly of the curve term is used in newspapers commonly. You can read it very easily. So as you can see here also in this point, sovereign bonds. So usually the governments, they borrow for about 8 to 12 years tenure, which is known as the belly of the curve and the market wants a fair price. That means market wants a higher interest rate for swallowing the supply of bonds, right? So I hope uh, this question was clear to you. So guys, these were the five questions for today. And I hope you learned something new from this video. If you did, then don't forget to give us a thumbs up and till and i'll be back in the next session with some new information till then take care of yourself keep your studies going on and guys don't forget to uh, comment with the answers uh, uh, of that question i just asked in the beginning of the session session i'll be waiting for your answers right so see you in the next session and thank you for being here goodbye